Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Money Hours webinar. And uh, first, we'll just give maybe a minute or so. And for those of you who are here with us on Facebook Live, thank you very much for spending this evening with us. Uh, please do feel free to go into the chat box and say hello and 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 and, and say hi. Do feel free, free to do so. Really, thank you for coming on time. I think we'll just give it one minute uh, before we start. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Okay. All right. Uh, let me just do a check with my colleagues whether we are good to make a start. So, Sherry, could you just give me a shout? Ah, uh, yes, we're good to start. Great, yeah. And uh, shall we move our speakers in then as well for today? Okay. Good evening again, everybody, and welcome to Money Hours webinar on a wiser way to build passive income. And this is our agenda today in three main sections. And before I begin, I would like to uh, welcome our speakers and also quickly introduce them and their companies. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Mr. Christopher Tan, who is the CEO and also founder of Provident. Provident is Singapore's first and probably still the uh, only fee-only fee comprehensive wealth advisor. Provident was established in 2001 and served mainly the affluent and high-income families. However, uh, Provident and uh, Chris have also been serving the mass market in their own way for decades through educational talks, uh, thought leadership, and also as a member of the esteemed CPF Life Advisory Panel. And so their uh, reputation for expertise and uh, ethical practice really precede them. And that is how actually uh, NTUC Enterprise approached Provident uh, to form the joint company that you see before you today, which is Money Hour. And of all the things that Chris is, I am a very privileged and honored to call him a friend and also a co-founding director with me at Money Hour. And second, after uh, Chris speaks, we will have uh, Vincent and myself who will introduce Fulton Money Hour Wise Income. And Fulton was founded in 2003, uh, first as a uh, Tomasic Internal Fund Management uh, arm, and then uh, now it serves uh, real institutions as well as, as retails and is co-owned by Tomastic and uh, our sister company NTUC Income. Fullerton manages over 60 billion of assets and is an Asian market specialist committed also to providing financial solutions and retirement solutions uh, to people in Singapore. Vincent himself is a seasoned investment professional with years of experience in places like GIC and TUC Income. And it's, but it's really his passion for retirement solutions for the ordinary people that uh, give life to all uh, this expertise that he has. And just a word about uh, Money Owl. So Money Owl, we are Singapore's first bionic financial advisor, which means that we bring human advice together with technology for you in serving you. We are a comprehensive advisor and Singapore's uh, first and probably only financial advisor that is all three things, independent, a fully comprehensive, and with salary advisors. As I mentioned, we are an NTUC provident company, so we are not fly by night. You know, we are here to stay. We have a deep heritage that we bring to you and the obligation that we bring to you. And so you know that uh, even as your financial planning is a lifelong process, that you have an advisor who is here to stay for the long haul. So I will bring us through the second section and also uh, then Sherry, my colleague, uh, here will moderate our Q&A. So without further ado, can I just ask Chris to maybe take over from here for uh, his segment on how we should approach retirement planning. Okay, thank you, Chun Ting, and uh, a very good evening to each one of you. Thank you so much for coming in early and uh, to join us for this evening's event. I trust that you are 
either having dinner or you have had uh, dinner. Um, but this evening, I've been asked to talk about how do we approach our retirement planning. And that will sort of set the context for what we're going to talk about um, during the later part of the evening, which is uh, on the topic, of course, on uh, wise income. So let me begin, okay, so that uh, we can uh, finish this part and then we go and talk about a more exciting thing, uh, which is really uh, wise income. So I want to start first by talking about the three things that you need at retirement, because sometimes retirement planning can be very complex. Sometimes we talk about retirement planning, you know, we don't know where to start. But if I reduce retirement planning to its irreducible minimum, then there are really three things that we need to be able to have at retirement. So the first thing that we need to have at retirement is to have a fully paid house. And I know that's very important for all of us, right? I mean, it is important for us when we retire that we have a shelter over our head that nobody can take away. It is important that there is no more mortgage, no more liabilities. It is a house that we can retire, you know, until one day we are no longer around. So a fully paid house is very important at retirement. And thankfully in Singapore, most of us, we have CPF. And whilst it may not be the best idea to use CPF to pay for the mortgages, well, CPF somehow allows us to buy our first house. It allows us to put down our deposit and even it helps to pay our monthly mortgage. So CPF is there, it's not just a retirement fund, but it's there to help us pay for our house. And of course, sometimes because of the house that we buy, uh, it may not be enough um, just to use our CPF to pay. And therefore, we might have to use cash, especially if you are buying a bigger house or we are buying a private property and that can be pretty expensive, then we might have to use cash. So the first thing we need at retirement is a fully paid house. Now, the second thing that we need at retirement is that we must have a suitable medical insurance. And that's very important as well. Because when we retire and as we get older, well, there is a chance that we may fall sick. And if we do, and if we have to be warded into the hospitals, then we want to make sure that we have a suitable medical insurance that will pay for all our bills. I mean, we do not want to dip into our retirement fund because if we do that, when we retire, then our retirement lifestyle might be affected. And that is why it is important to have a suitable medical insurance. And again, thankfully for most of us, if we are Singaporeans or PR, we all know that we have a universal uh, medical insurance in the form of uh, MediShield Life. I'm just going to use my laser pointer to point. So we have MediShield Life and MediShield Life is sufficient for us to pay for the big bills if we stay in a government B2 or government hospital B2 and C1. But we also know that if we want to have the option to stay in a higher ward, let's say a B1 and above, then MediShield Life may not be suitable. There is a need well, to upgrade and therefore we upgrade to what we call IP, Integrated Plan, or otherwise also known as Integrated Shield Plan. And if we have that, then it allows us to stay in B1, A ward, or any of the private hospitals in Singapore. Second thing, medical insurance. Now, then the third thing that we must have at retirement, and it is the topic that we are going to focus a lot on this evening, and that is we want to have a reliable income stream for our lifestyle when we retire. And when we talk about income streams, well, we first talk about what we call the safe retirement income floor. And by that, I mean this is the amount of money that you must have every month. And in our Singaporean term, it is die, die must have, right? So again, thankfully, if we have got our CPF, then at 65 years old, we know that our CPF will pay out a stream of income from the scheme called CPF Life, lifelong income for the elderly. So CPF Life will give us that safe retirement income floor to meet that basic expenses. But if we want to have the option to live a lifestyle beyond what CPF Life can afford us to live, well, then we need additional income. And we just cannot depend on CPF life alone. We need to then have other forms of investments. So three things that we must have at retirement, a fully paid house, a suitable medical insurance, a lifelong income stream to take care of the lifestyle that we want. And if you look at, well, the basic building blocks, if you look at the blocks in dark green colors, 
these are the national or this is the national scheme. And that is why Money Out, we always say that when we plan for retirement, we always start with the national scheme as the foundation. Yeah. So three things you must have. And if we understand that, then this is how our retirement plan will look like. So assuming that this is your lifeline and you are now down here, regardless of your age, and at a certain age now in Singapore, maybe 50, 55, some of us may want to retire at 40, 45, but whatever age you want to retire, like what I've just said, three things you must have, house, medical insurance, income stream. And so how do you get there? Especially how do you save and invest towards that income stream? What is your accumulation journey? How does it look like? Well, firstly, as we all know, well, we can make use of our CPF, either the ordinary and special account to save towards that income stream, stream out in a form of CPF life. And CPF is not bad. I mean, our ordinary account can be as high as 3.5%. Our special account, a part of it can be as high as 5%. So it's pretty good and uh, almost risk-free. The only thing is that if we want to put in money in our CPF, we just have to accept that we may not have that liquidity. So CPF is, is an instrument, if I may call it, to use for our accumulation journey towards our retirement lifestyle, especially for the income stream part. And of course, in Singapore, many people like to buy things like endowment plans, retirement income plans. Well, at Money Hour, we think it's fine. Uh, we don't advocate ILP, but we think that, well, if someone wants to use endowment and retirement income, it's fine. Except that if we want to use insurance for accumulation, then you have to accept that the returns won't be very high, maybe 3% at best. And if you want to use that to accumulate, you may have to set aside a lot of money in the form of premiums to save towards your retirement lifestyle. And of course, the other options would be you can use investments to accumulate towards your retirement. And so you will accumulate towards your retirement to give you that income stream. And then when it's time for you to retire, then we go into a new phase of your retirement. And that is the withdrawal phase. Now in your withdrawal phase now, it's actually more complicated than your accumulation phase. Well, we need as we mentioned, your basic income, and that can come from CPF life or from your retirement income insurance. But if you want additional income for a better lifestyle, then you have got to invest. And of course, there are various instruments again that you can use for investments. You can use bonds, you can use stocks and shares, you can buy REITs on your own, real estate investment trust. Also for some of us whom financially we are more able, then yes, you can buy your second property, your third property, and you can collect rental income. But as we all know, if we want to use bonds, stocks, or REITs, then we must have certain amount of capital. Otherwise, we won't be able to diversify enough. And of course, you must be um, investment savvy. You must know what to buy, and you need to monitor these instruments. It may not be easy for many of us. And where properties are concerned, well, for a lot of us, after we buy our first or even our second property, a lot of our resources, well, they are really tied to that property and it doesn't allow us to diversify anymore. So buying property can give us that income, yes, but it also exposes us to that concentrated risk. So you can do that, but perhaps there are other options as well. And we need to do, we need to withdraw at least until the day when unfortunately we are no longer around. So if you look at retirement planning, the entire retirement plan doesn't just start from accumulation and end at retirement. The entire retirement plan must include the accumulation phase. It must also include the withdrawal phase. And as I mentioned, it is the withdrawal phase that is actually more complex. And if we are planning for our retirement, we need to start with the end in mind. We need to understand the complexity during the withdrawal phase, even as we are accumulating towards our retirement. Now, why do I say that our withdrawal phase is more complex than the accumulation phase? Because there are five risks that a retiree will face during the withdrawal phase. The first risk will be longevity risk. And by longevity risk, what I mean is the risk of us outliving our money. When we are still alive and kicking, 
we run out of money. And we, I'm sure we all understand that. And I don't want to spend too much time here. First race, longevity race. Now, the second race that a retiree will face is inflation race. And, uh, inflation race. and again, I'm sure we all understand inflation race. This is the risk of things becoming more expensive or the purchasing power of the $1 that we have at retirement going down. That's the second risk. The third risk, healthcare risk. It is the risk of us incurring huge medical bills. It's not the risk of us falling sick, but it is the risk of us incurring huge medical bills that we may not be able to afford. So that's the third risk. The fourth risk is investing risk. I'm going to spend a bit more time later on investing, but suffice it to say at this point that when we talk about investing risk, we are not just talking about volatility risk. We are also talking about sequence of return risk. And I'll explain a little bit more in the next slide. But I really want to talk about the fifth risk, which is overspending risk. It is the risk of retiree overspending, especially in the earlier stage of retirement. There are enough studies that have been done to show that at retirement, usually the earlier few years, retirees tend to spend more. Perhaps maybe they are healthier and they just retired, right? And if you have been working so hard for many years of your life and when you retire, I mean, the first thing you really want to do is you really want to spend on yourself. You want to go traveling. I know we can't do traveling now, but well, when the skies open up, the aviation you know, industry, the, the, the plane starts to fly again. And if we retire, we want to fly. And if we don't manage our expenses well, especially using during the early stages of our retirement, then there is a risk that we overspend, leaving not enough to the later part of our retirement years. So keep these five risks in mind. Longevity, inflation, healthcare risk, investing, and overspending. Now, I'm going to just zoom in a little bit on investing because it's worth us understanding this particular risk, especially in your retirement years. What is this thing called sequence of returns risk? Now, let me start first with an accumulator. So let's say you're an accumulator and you start, you have $100,000 to start accumulating towards your retirement, right? Now, so let's say you start accumulating at the age of 41 years old and you have got two portfolios you can choose from, portfolio A and portfolio B. Now, so portfolio A, if you look at the patterns of the returns, you realize that the first three years for portfolio A, it is largely negative. But when you look at portfolio B, the first three years, very positive. Of course, these numbers are, well, a bit extreme, exaggerated. It's just to show a point, yeah? And in between is mixed bags. Some years are positive, some years are negative. But during the last few years of an accumulator, you realize that now portfolio A is positive the last few years, and portfolio B now is negative. So starts with negative, mix, and with positive. Starts with positive for portfolio B, mix in between again, and then towards the end of the last few years for portfolio B, negative. Two different patterns of return for both portfolios. Now, the thing about being an accumulator is this. Whether you invest in portfolio A or B, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in terms of returns. It may matter in terms of the experience of investing, but it doesn't really matter in terms of return because as long as you stay invested, at the end of your accumulation years, which is uh, at the age of 65 in this example, the average return is about 8%. And as long as the average return for both portfolios are 8%, then you realize that the accumulated value, there is no difference. From 100,000, it has grown to about $684,000. So the sequence of how the returns come in during your accumulation phase is not really important in terms of accumulating the amount that you want. But it does make a difference for a retiree. So using the same example, now this retiree has accumulated 684000 thereabout. And assuming that he's withdrawing at 5%, let's just say, and he starts accumulating from age 66. And again, if you look at the sequence of return, the pattern for portfolio A and portfolio B, portfolio A started with negative, mix, and then positive. Portfolio B again started with positive, just like you know the earlier years, and then mix, and then negative right at the bottom. 
But now, this guy is withdrawing. He's withdrawing about 5% from the 684 that he has accumulated. And you will realize that for portfolio A, by the time this guy reaches 81 years old or 82 years old, he ran out of money. But for portfolio B, it is still growing. Now, I know, again, like I say, the numbers may be exaggerated, but it's just to prove a point that the sequence of return for a retiree makes a big difference. Why? Because you really do not want to sell down from your capital in the earlier years because, or rather, you don't want to sell down when the markets are down because it's a double whammy, right? You are, sp you are selling to spend, but you are selling at a time the market is falling. Your money runs out faster. And that is what we mean when we say investing risk for a retiree. Yes, the volatility, well, it affects, but beyond volatility is also the sequence of how the returns come in when you are withdrawing. And when even though you are young now, for some of us in the room, and I can't see your faces, but even you are young and you are accumulating, we must pick you the animal. We must understand that these are the risks that retiree face when you retire during the withdrawal phase so that when you are accumulating, well, you know the correct instruments to use. So this is the dilemma of retirees with longevity we need to make sure we don't outlive our income. Now we have CPF life. It helps to solve part of this problem because CPF life, it pays for as long as we live. We all know that. But the second problem is that healthcare cost is rising. And with MediShield life, well, again, it takes care of the large bills. And for those of us whom you have an IP, well, that takes care of even larger bills, especially if you are at say, an A ward or a private hospital. Inflation makes it worse. It compounds the problem further, right? With longevity, we need more money, but inflation compounds it. And the thing about CPF life, whilst we like it very much, it doesn't mitigate inflation risk very well. I mean, there are only three plans for CPF life, basic standard and the escalating payout plan. Yes, I know that the escalating payout plan seemingly mitigate infl uh, inflation but well if we understand the escalating payout plan better it doesn't really mitigate it very well and we are not here to talk about cpf but most of us will probably choose the basic or the standard plan and it's a flat payout it doesn't mitigate inflation risk so longevity risk healthcare risk inflation risk if we need to beat inflation we need to invest our assets right so we need to invest but what is the problem? The problem is that investing carries risk. We just talked about it. It is not just volatility. It is also sequence of return. Yes, it's volatility during your accumulation years, but during your retirement years, it's not just volatility, the ups and downs of the investment that makes you really uncomfortable. It is also the sequence of return. How do we then manage this risk effectively as retirees become more and more risk averse? And the last definitely not risk, undisciplined or compulsive spending, it depletes our savings faster, especially if we spend during the earlier years. How do we put up a spending plan? This is the dilemma of retiree. CPF is good. Well, it doesn't solve everything. It's a good foundation. And we definitely should use it, but it doesn't solve everything. So then how? Well, this is why we are here tonight to talk about how we can build over and above CPF as the foundation. So right at the bottom, to give us the die-die must have money, what I call the safe retirement income floor, you can make use of CPF life. It starts paying out from age 65. If you want an earlier payout, you want to retire earlier, then well, you may have to use your other resources monies from your OA and SA after age 55. If you have got enough set aside in your RA, then your OA, SA, well, it can be liquid enough for you to take it out to form part of your retirement spending. Or some of us may use retirement income insurance plans. That's fine. As long as you accept that the returns may not be very high. These so-called instruments, it forms the foundation. It gives you a very basic lifestyle. But if you want an option for a better lifestyle, and to mitigate those risks that we talked about earlier, then, well, we may have to invest. You can rent or rather you can 
invest in an additional property and collect rental income. You can invest in stock and shares and collect dividends. You can buy corporate bonds on your own and collect coupons. All this you can do if you are savvy enough, you have time, you have enough resources to buy enough of securities to be fully diversified. You can buy one or two properties. But what if we don't have that expertise? We don't have that time. We don't have that experience. And we don't have a large amount of capital to spread over different securities. It is precisely because of these challenges that we know Singaporeans are facing, that Money Owl has developed this very interesting fund called the Fullerton Money Owl Wise Income Fund. And it is at this point that I hand over to Chun Ting uh, to talk a little bit more about Wise Income. Thank you, Chris, for sharing that. And uh, in this segment, I would be speaking together with Vincent Chan and about Firstly, we will build a little bit about what Chris talked about and go a little bit and unpack really why is it that we need to invest for and during retirement and how do we invest for income withdrawal? Uh, the, the, how do we mitigate the sequence of returns risk? What are some of the general principles that apply to investing and what are some of the additional ones that we need to take care of? Thereafter, we go into the features of Fullerton Money Our Wise Income, how we find that it is fit for purpose and especially for Singapore. And then let's put it all together and summarize before we move on to Q&A. Yeah, could I bring uh, Vincent on, please? Yeah. Okay, so here we just recap the pictures here in which we have the three must-haves that Chris shared. And this is really about our needs of shelter, our needs for medical care, especially in old age, and also a need for income well for daily expenses, our eating, drinking, uh, clothes and all that. And these three must-haves uh, more or less mitigate the longevity, inflation, and healthcare risk to, to some extent. So, uh, Vincent, what is your perspective really on uh, these? How, how does investing come in, you know? Because the, don't the three must have um, more or less mitigate the, you know, the, 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 the at least the three risks that we talk about? What, is, what are some of the things that we really need to uh, bear in mind? Um, well, first of all, thank you to, uh, to the audience for taking time. Um, I, I, I do appreciate that you are having <clears throat> a late evening with us, uh, but this is a very important topic. Uh, there are two particular risks I would like to share with you. Um, I will use a lot of my anecdotes, a lot of the experience of people that I come across to make this point come to life. Uh, in front of you, you can see one of the risks that we need to worry about is longevity risk, something that Chris already mentioned. Um, now, this is something that is new, uh, not only to Singaporeans, but globally it's a new phenomenon because you have people living much uh, longer. I can recall about two years ago, uh, NTC Income launched a very successful campaign. It's called the Sandwich uh, Generation, where it shows a young family man uh, struggling to meet the needs of his newborn baby and also caring for his parents. Uh, this is someone in the 30s. But what is important, I think, uh, that I want to share with you is that this sandwich generation has now moved higher in terms of the age group. Uh, I, can, I can share this experience with you. Uh, in front of you, you can see of the people who are aged 65 and above, close to half of them will live beyond 85 and one third of them will live beyond 90. I myself is uh, in the 50 to 60 years age group. I've, I've already withdrawn, uh, I'm able to withdraw uh, my CPF. I've already opened my retirement account. This is something that uh, some of you have gone through and experienced yourself, but for the younger audience, I want you to know that because people are living longer, for the people in that 50 or even 60 years age group, when they find that they are about to finish their employment life, their parents are still uh, healthy, still living. So it is a very different situation. It is not just sandwich and you're still actively employed. You could be in a situation when you're reaching the end of your employment life, uh, the income will dwindle a lot, your parents are still alive, and uh, they could be seeing their grandchildren or great-grandchildren. So this is a, a worldwide phenomenon. It comes with aging, 
and it is a phenomenon that the uh, uh, human population has never seen before because life expectancy has never gone to such a, a long period. So that's the first point I want to share with you. The second slide I like to share with you is the life expectancy. This again, I like to share my personal experience. The average life expectancy of males is about 81, for females 85, and it is rising uh, with uh, medical uh, advancement. Now, when I have conversation with uh, both my mother and my father-in-law, they normally compare their condition to their average life expectancy. And for that, I prepared a very simple Q&A because I, I think this is something that all of us can relate to. Now, from the earlier slide, someone already in their 65 cohort, half of them will live beyond 85 and one third of them will live beyond 90. The question I want to ask yourself, just think about it carefully. If you are already at 75 and knowing that life expectancy is 81 for male and 85 for female, what are your chances of living beyond 85 and beyond 90? Is it higher or lower than when you were at 65? So let me repeat the question. Um, at age 65, you have a two-third chance of living beyond 85, one third, half, 50 percent chance of living beyond 50, 85, and one third chance of living beyond 90. But wind the clock forward if you are at 75. Are you likely to have a higher chance or lower chance of living beyond those two thresholds? Now, you may answer the question yourself, but I have done this quiz uh, among uh, other forums, other participants, and a fair amount, uh, probably around 60% of people, think like my mom and think like my father in law because they reference themselves to the life expectancy. Uh, I think about uh, when they reach around late 70s or 80, it is quite common they use the phrase, I don't have much longer to live. I'm not asking for more. Life expectancy is 85. I'm already 80. So is this correct? Because uh, when you look at the statistics, which is what I, I would like to share with you in this table, some of you may be surprised. Uh, in the table, it shows that at different age group, I was talking about age 75 just now. That is uh, uh, somewhere in the middle, age 75. The chances of these people living beyond age 85 has gone up from 50% to 65%, two third. And it has gone up from one third to 40% chance of living beyond 90. Uh, it may be surprising to some of you, those of you who got the answers correct, then you have a very uh, good mind thinking about statistics and understanding about the average, the, the large uh, group of population, the large group of people the life expectancy is an average phenomenon. By the time the individual reached 75, unfortunately, those people who did not live as long, they would have uh, passed on. But those people who are still around, they form uh, part of the total population that gives you an average outcome of age 85. So by the time you are 75, many of the colleagues, uh, your cohort, or even earlier generation, they didn't make it to age 75. But the remaining one are by selection, the healthy one, and the chances that they live beyond 85 and beyond 90 is actually much, much higher. So the older the person is, the higher chance is it, it is for the individual to live beyond 85 and 95. It has two important implications. The first implication is that when people grow older, they may actually wrongly think that their investment horizon is getting shorter. But in reality, the chances of living longer actually increases and you must have sufficient money to pay for the retirement journey uh, that uh, Chris talked about. The other point to highlight is this. The female uh, population in general, they live longer. So if you're planning as a young couple or as an elderly couple, don't just plan the retirement needs for yourself but you must set aside some more for your partner, your wife. So that, that is a very important lesson I learned myself. Or maybe Vincent, that ladies should also be planning for themselves. And uh, in fact, for wise income 
our, among our clients, we actually do see uh, many ladies. So perhaps, you know, they are very aware that uh, they will have to be living longer. Uh, and and uh, But it's really quite scary because the idea of, you know, I'm thinking about myself, uh, I, I don't know whether I, I have any energy by then, you know, whether I have any diseases, whether we're bedridden and, and so on. Yeah. Let me, since we're on, on this topic of uh, health matters, let's uh, move on to the next slide. This is another topic which I like to share with our viewers here. It's about medical inflation. Uh, these are the statistics for Singapore. The medical inflation rate is rising at a very rapid rate. It is not surprising because uh, medical science has advanced a lot. Uh, it takes a lot of money to train a doctor and to keep uh, the specialist surgeon uh, to be in top form. They have to go for many years of training and multiple exams even after they graduate. So the medical inflation in Singapore is close to 9%. Now, uh, I'm sure some of you already are familiar with the rule of 72. What it means is that uh, the number of years it takes to double uh, is basically 72 divided by the rate of compounding. If the rate of compounding is 8%, 72 divided by 8, it takes nine years for your uh, money to compound. But of course, we're talking about medical inflation. It is not compounding to your advantage. It is eating away your purchasing power of your money. So uh, take a simple surgery, which many uh, old people eventually uh, would face as their body parts uh, weaken, uh, their heart may experience blockage uh, problem. Uh, Angioplasty is a very common surgery. These days uh, it's done, I think within a few days, the patient can check out. If you check on the public website, the cost of angioplasty, which is putting a stand to actually um, expand the veins, the arteries, so that blood flow will not be clogged and the patient will not experience a heart attack. That cost in the public unsubsidized ward is between 30 to 40,000 today. If you go to a private hospital, it costs you anywhere between forty to sixty thousand for the surgery. Now, twenty years from now, if the patient were to go back and have a similar procedure, the cost would easily go up to one hundred and sixty thousand. Basically, forty thousand on average. You double twice. You double in the first nine years. It becomes eighty thousand. And the next nine years, so basically within a 20 year period, the same procedure will cost the person 160,000. It is a very big sum of money. So the point I want to make, which is in the uh, next bullet point is, inflation is very important. And it's not just uh, normal inflation for the elderly, for the people who are retired. It is the medical inflation that is important. You must have sufficient savings to cash up with all these expenses. The next bullet point that is there, the last line there, it is a common error that people make. They, they are fearful of uncertainty. They're fearful that their hard-earned money is subject to market volatility. So they want to invest in very safe instruments. Uh, the safest you, you can get is buy a government bond, put your money in a fixed deposit. Now that is true. What it saves the investor is the risk of capital loss because volatility is very low. But in exchange, this investor actually had took on another form of risk, another form of financial risk that he's not aware of. While he may be saving and reducing or minimizing capital loss, he is most likely increasing the risk of not having sufficient money. So this is what we call uh, a capital shortfall or saving shortfall where the person doesn't have enough funding for retirement. This is a financial risk that uh, many people who plan for their investment have sort of mixed up or overlooked. While they want to be on the safe side in terms of investment, they're actually taking on a lot of financial shortfall risk by not having sufficient savings uh, at the end of the accumulation phase. That's all I'd like to share at this point. Um, Pass back to uh, Chiu Ting. Yes, uh, thanks so much, Vincent. Yes, so indeed, I think it's really very sobering because it seems that you know a lot of times people act out of fear to say, okay, let's let's not let not take any risk, and that seems prudent, but it's actually probably the most imprudent thing that you can do, which is to know already that there will be things eating called inflation, medical inflation, eating away your money. 
And uh, really, when it comes to the future, even 10 years or 15 years, we don't know how the scene will be, but both for ourselves as well as for uh, for retirement. And in the area of aging and elder care, this is one area that the uh, country as a whole, the government, and uh, even uh, in, in the NTUC group through NTUC Health, we are very concerned uh, about. So elder care, uh, we have some statistics here. One in two healthy Singaporeans age 65 could become severely disabled in their lifetime, says the MOH. Now that's really one in two. I, I just saw perhaps we have about 200 people here. So 100 uh, of us are, are going to be like that, right? So between uh, Vincent, Chris, Sherry and me, we pick two, two of us. You know, we're going to be severely disabled. And there we've got a long a chance that we can be disabled for many many years so this is on the disabled living and where are all these other uh, the the expenses associated with that going to come about i have a parent who is in this situation and you know that there are there are many uh, expenses and our government has put in cashew life which does help on the lower to middle income level but you know elder care is uh, also about uh, you know how how do we have a meaningful life? You know, do we go to a daycare daycare place? Uh, how do we uh, be safe at the same time? How do we uh, take care of ourselves or all these out pocket things that have nothing actually to do with uh, med, you know medical expenses per se? It's more like kind of uh, living expenses, but in an elderly way. So private care is something that we are evolving along the way, and the the structure is changing. The costs are not so well known. So if the subsidized care it's not really something that, uh, that is sufficient for you, then you might have to think about building that buffer. So much of financial planning is about building buffers. And here we're talking about building buffers that for an aging Singapore. And there's always this question in my mind, you know, uh, like my, currently my, my father is taken care of by an uh, uh, excellent domestic helper. Uh, will we always have foreign domestic help? You know, and, and so are some of the, 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 the things that we are planning for, we, we think are sufficient, are, are they really uh, sufficient? So it's really more about certainty and building buffers are uh, important uh, around the must-haves. And in this case, it is a must-have of retirement income, but retirement income for uh, a kind of elderly type of aging. And when it comes to medical inflation, perhaps you might you might uh, ask because uh, Chris said that you know you you have uh, shield right and you have integrated shield, so uh, why why isn't that uh, that that should take care of all those medical bills? You know that that uh, eighty thousand or uh, forty thousand percent uh, uh, medical inflation. I think the answer is yes and no. Uh, there could be you still have to pay something and that's through the co-payment and it could increase uh, and definitely as you grow older your premiums get higher now there is something going on now with all the ip restructuring uh, there's a big fight between the you know uh, sort of blame and all that uh, finger pointing between insurers and uh, doctors and that th this is still evolving where maybe in return for lower premiums a uh, co-payment can be increased or there might be a cap on the choices that you have in terms of panel doctors uh, Overall, it's a good web development, but uh, suffice to say here that we do not know because things can change. Now, if you had thought that uh, buying that shield plan, you know, would, would have solved our problems for life because you have it as charged and you have it, uh, you know, uh, what is first dollar, right? Well, that has changed. So what else will change in the area of medical expenses in future? We do not know, but we know we have to pay premiums. We know the premiums go up with age. And this table that you see here is already, we're talking about the uh, private uh, wards, you know, uh, five six thousand dollars once you get into very old age and this is already after the reduction in premiums because of the change in structure now there are some treatments that are not covered by medical life not covered by integrated shield plans these include uh, say tcm other alternative methods that don't have experimental drugs and, and that uh, if you want to have that option yeah you might be able to cover some of this for example through a whole life plan that uh, pays out but usually such plans are not as flexible there is a, a condition for example it must be a critical illness in, upon which you pay out and so you can't really use insurance to cover everything uh, and you should not try to do that because then you actually uh, will be very uh, expensive for you so again here when you talk about medical inflation we cannot assume that we're totally uh, totally immune yes do have that must have of that integrated shield plan but build a buffer on top of it again right so we take our must haves and we build that buffer above retirement income for for life expectancy that is, that is longer for elder care costs that may be higher or might change in structure and we build a buffer on top 
of our potential medical needs. Because unfortunately, while Singaporeans are living longer, a lot of us are not living healthily into this uh, old age. So you might tell me, well, do you think you know you, you don't have very good genes, uh, right? And then you spend all your time in front of a computer, doing webinar, doing PowerPoint, and writing long emails to terrorize your staff. But you know, maybe I'm not like you, you know, I'm active and fit and you know, I'm trim and uh, I have, I, I'm not going to become disabled. I'm not going to become uh, ill. Okay, granted, right? If you have that contract with God, you know, to say that you're immune from this. But what I want to say is that our lives change. Our life goals change. You know, when you are 25 and you're doing financial planning, uh, you haven't met anybody yet, you know, uh, but maybe at, at 30s, I want to get married. Oh, I want to have children. Are children good for good for my, my financial plan? Uh, last time, yes, la, you know, they, they, they're they supposed to give you money. Uh, my, my grandfather retired at 40 because he got like 15 children, all professionals, and they gave him uh, money. La. So from 40 years old, he retired until he died in 99. But it's not like that nowadays, you know that. So what, what does it mean for you in terms of a financial plan? What if you're, uh, what if I, I, I want to take a break from work, I want to start a business, you know, uh, and and, uh, uh, and do, do something something good, you know, do make something like money hour, you know, <laughs> for, for the people. Then uh, how long will my retirement last, you know, on, on the right side, say, or should I downsize? What, what if my child needs a leg up? Property is so expensive. I want to do something. So again, this is talking about building margins, building options, right? It may not be on the downside. You know, maybe we, we scared you a lot, you know, all these figures, one in one in two, one in three and all that. But what about providing yourself with options? Eh? So at this point, really, we're talking about investing for retirement and also investing during retirement. Just now, we talked about uh, how we have long life expectancy. And Vincent talked about how you have this misconception of that you are not taking risk, but actually you're taking even more risk, right? So one thing that we want to say here is really that if your plan is to keep your retirement money all in fixed D, that size of that nest egg will be very, very huge, right? It will be almost, I think, not, not very uh, affordable for most of us. Right? And uh, if you do that, then you actually take on more longevity risk and more inflation risk because you cannot count the number of, of years to which you die because you do not know. Is it 85, is it 95 or, or what it is? And of course, you do not know inflation. And if you plan to do that, you're 40 years old now, and say, I'm only I'm going to keep in fixed D. Okay, I'm invest a little bit now, but then I'm going to keep in fixed D or I don't want to invest at all now. You're actually trading off a meaningful life now in which you can spend some of your money uh, and save some rather than save most everything for um, trading off this because of that having to accumulate that excessiveness in. and the second point actually is more an encouragement that you know if, if you're going to live till 85 90 and and so on think about it again that you actually have that ability to invest the ability to invest is the ability to ride out the ups and downs of the market in the short term and even in the medium term because you do not need to cash out during a certain time so that is why you should and you can actually continue to invest during retirement, of course, subject to certain preconditions, which is that you really must be able to take some volatility. You must understand the investing for withdrawal, which Chris alluded to and which we talk about a little bit more later. And of course, you need the right instrument, the right solution and the right advice. So, uh, Vincent, perhaps you want to chime in here a little bit on you know, what I was talking about in terms of the size of the nest egg and, and all that. Yes, I think it's very timely because uh, uh, Fullerton, when we design uh, financial products and solution, we actually want to find out uh, what are the needs, uh, what are the gaps, and uh, what are the products that's most suitable to, to meet these uh, objectives of our savers and our investors. So we actually did a commission, we, we commissioned a survey of about 1,000 people uh, sometime in quarter four last year. Uh, we want to know whether people perception they're thinking about retirement uh the way they make investment has all this changed because of COVID 19. uh the report will be published tomorrow so what i'm sharing with you is uh just a few hours before the press release so it's really fresh but i'm going to give you uh three highlights uh the report has uh is, is very very interesting when you have time tomorrow you'll be in the in the newspaper uh, there'll be a link to the website. Uh, please download that report to understand what your fellow Singaporeans are thinking about. 
So the first of the three points I'd like to share from that findings is this figure 1.4 million. 1.4 million turns out to be the average amount the Singaporean uh, feel that they need to retire comfortably. Uh, when I look at this survey results, this was the first number that uh, caught me by surprise. I've been uh, doing retirement solution, retirement products and, and financial planning for quite a number of years, uh, both in GIC, in NTC Income and now in Fullerton. Uh, but I've noticed over the years, the number that people want uh, in their bank account when they retire has been creeping up, but it, it was a big jump because of COVID-19. I think people realize that a lot more things uh, in life is uncertain. They do want to be adequately prepared. So 1.4 million is the figure. I also want to share this figure in the context of a, a ratio that is commonly used by financial planner which is the ratio of your uh, retirement savings to the median income uh, that's earned each year. The median income of Singaporeans uh, is about uh, 55,000 per annum. This is the uh, median annual income. So the ratio 1.4 million to 55,000 is about 25 times. This is a very large number. Uh, in most countries, uh, the numbers are seldom above 15 times. Now we're talking about 25 multiples. So the aspiration of, among Singaporeans has really gone up. Uh, they do want to provide for uncertainty. And I think the positive, positive findings from the survey is they do define retirement very differently from earlier generations. They see retirement as a new stage in life, a new beginning, and they want to make sure that they have enough uh, financial uh, means to actually help them achieve the next stage in life. Talking about next stage in life, I really think that uh, staying healthy is very important. So I'm keeping to my 10,000 steps a day. Just make sure that uh, I'm healthy and not spend away my nest egg on medical bills. Now, the second finding is simply this. Uh, this the respondents, the 1,000 respondents are quite realistic. One in five realize that they have to continue working. Whatever age they plan to retire early on, it could be 50, it could be 55. Uh, these days, we're talking about 60, 65. One in five of them realize that it is beyond their reach. Uh, the savings that they have typically is from CPF, the CPF life that Chris talked about, their investment income, their insurance policy. When you add up all these things, including their bank account, they find that it's not sufficient and one in five of them needs to continue working. That's the second finding. The third finding probably speaks to a younger cohort, people who uh, are logging in in this Facebook uh, webinar. Uh, this is something that would not be surprising for some of you uh, because in reality, it actually reflects the, the burden of um, the demands, financial demands played on people of different age group. When we survey the 1,000 respondents, we put them in four different age groups. The 20 to uh, 21 to, to 30, 31 to uh, 40, and then the 40s, and then anyone above 50. What we found, uh, and this is very important when we make our, our financial plan, uh, is that the people most underprepared is actually the 30s and 40s. Why do I say that they're most underprepared? It's because it's not because that they're not aware that they need to start early. It's not that they're unfamiliar with the need to uh, plan for their own retirement. It is because they're caught in that stage of their life that the financial demands on them is coming from multiple direction. It's coming from children's education. It is coming from uh, paying off a mortgage. It's coming from supporting their parents who may have medical bills to take care of. So they found that even though they are very aware of uh, the need to have regular savings for their own retirement, those people in their 30s and 40 age group realize that they just cannot come up with the extra money. So they lack the, lack the ability to, to save in a very regular disciplined manner. And what is uh, very damaging is that once they miss this golden years, a good 10 or even 20 years of uh, 
investment income where they can compound and grow their wealth. By the time when most of these financial burdens uh, move on already, they've already met the, the housing bill, they've already met the children's education and so on, they realize that the remaining time is not enough. So this is something that I'd like to share with you. Uh, the third point from our, our survey finding, if you're in the age group, no matter how difficult it is, do set aside something for your own retirement savings. Back to Thank you. you, Vincent. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, this really speaks to, to, to us on the uh, need to look at uh, retirement firstly early, but also holistically, because we really have demands, you know, those in 30s, 40s. Uh, and when we look at our whole retirement plan, it is therefore very important that we start to see, okay, what do we already have, right? So we talk a lot about the gaps and we talk a lot about the feeling uh, and, and probably reality of, of not having enough. But we need to understand that when we invest for and during retirement, it is really in the context of a holistic plan. So many hours has a comprehensive planning service where we look at all these things, you know, your financial health, are you, are you having too much debt? And because we know that uh, ultimately what actually helps you to grow and become rich is not actually the, the things that go up and down in investments, it's actually your 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 savings rate right how much you not so much how much you earn but how much you can actually save and so you need to take a hard look at expenses and this is one very important element of financial health and then your insurance coverage so what, what happens with insurance coverage a lot of times we pay so much in insurance in singapore but we're actually undercovered and this is also another point that i want to make that we, we should look at our, in our financial life holistically because every dollar that goes towards expenses every dollar that goes with insurance is a dollar that you do not have elsewhere for saving and or for spending or for be, having a meaningful life so when we think about retirement then my first point here in summary is really use a combination of government schemes insurance solutions and investment to holistically and optimally address retirement needs and risk and on investing for retirement we encourage you to consider investing for retirement if Number one, you need more or you want more than what the basic government schemes can offer. And secondly, if you want some buffers and options to cater for uncertainties, both on the downside as well as on the upside in terms of providing you with options to change uh, your plans and your lifestyles. With this, I want to move on now to the next section when we talk about investing so if you're suitable for investing because you want to build buffers and you you are willing to understand uh, take some risk but understand and want to understand the risk here how then do you go about investing for the retirement uh, for income withdrawal which as chris said is a little bit more complicated and this is very important to understand this picture i showed from chris there is accumulation and there is withdrawal the way you invest in accumulation is different from the way you invest in withdrawal. And let's start with what is the goal of accumulation and what is the goal of withdrawal. And from there, we can know how do we invest differentially. First point, in wealth accumulation, you want to focus on capital appreciation. Because what is your goal? Your goal is at the end of a certain time horizon, right? So at the end of that time horizon, you, you don't really it doesn't matter to you what happens in between, but you want to be able to get that uh, that lump sum, if you will, that nest egg. And that's why we always say focus on the uh, sufficiency and the reliability of that. And so you, you use your need, ability and willingness to take risk and you understand risk in these terms that you are able to stay invested throughout that time horizon and your time horizon is probably the most important factor in your ability but on retirement what is the risk that you are mitigating the risk you're mitigating is that you cannot get that regular income over a long time and this is what you focus on so capital appreciation yes is good and capital appreciation is there because it gives you that buffer it gives you that support for that whole uh, fund to be doing what it does to be laying those eggs for you as it were so you you want a goose that can 
that, that, that can lay many eggs, right? So you feed the goose well, as it were. But it is about the income and it's not really about the return that you get. So it is what is the structure that gives you that best income most reliably. So on wealth accumulation, your investment strategy should focus on capital appreciation and in, in retirement withdrawal, focus on the income, the, the reliability of the income. In wealth accumulation, you may be able to take on higher risk if you have a, a long time horizon. But in retirement, even if you have the most, uh, a very, you're very willing to take risk, right? We will not recommend the most aggressive portfolio. Uh, if you're using only one portfolio, we'll probably uh, cap it at a 60 40, which is balanced fund, which is just like a wise income. And why is this? Because of the third point sequence of returns risk. We, we model out, you know, what happens to different portfolios and, and the different withdrawals. And really, what you need to, to mitigate is uh, that sequence of returns risk. You can't get rid of it totally. Uh, one of the things that you do do is actually to, uh, to, to choose the correct kind of portfolio allocation. But the uh, sequence of returns in wealth accumulation, as Chris should, does not matter, but it is, it is something that you need to mitigate in retirement. But what are the com commonalities, uh, general investing principles here? I mentioned one. A lot of times we are very tempted to focus on the return. There are many advisors out there who will, who will sell you funds based on the high promise of very high return and apparently at very low risk. Okay, And then you just take a look and see what, what is the time horizon in which you know, sometimes uh, returns are cherry picked. right? Uh, but it's focused on real sufficiency. The focus that it is sufficient for me. So if I don't have to go around maximizing maximizing my, my return in any every time period, I actually save myself from doing a lot of stupid things. And the reliability of return. Because this is what gives you peace of mind. Focus on asset allocation. Asset allocation is, is the, the largest explain, as, explainer, if I can put it that way, of the variability of returns between uh, portfolios. Stay invested. Don't time the market when you are investing, be it for accumulation or for retirement. We recommend you diversify. Diversification is often understood as a risk management, and I put it here, you know, don't pile into losers because sometimes you cannot tell in advance who's going to lose and who's going to win. But diversification also means that you always have a line in the water for the winners. So you also always end up holding some winners. And of course, keep costs low because every 1% that you spend on cost could have been that 1% of your return. So on this, then we really looked around and uh, was a solution that we were we, 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 we went about thinking how we can design it in an elegant way, in an easy way. Uh, we do have uh, an alternative solution that is really more advisor-led about withdrawal rules and, and all that. And that is available for us in our discussion with our comprehensive planning service. But uh, we also wanted to see if there's something that we can bring that, uh, that speaks to Singaporeans that can understand that it's suitable, low cost, and seamless, easy and elegant, you know, for, for mass market retirement withdrawal. And this was really where uh, we looked at uh, uh, around and see who has some experience in doing this, and who has the right, um, you know, uh, objective and intention uh, at as many hours does. And that's how uh, this partnership came about. And I think Vincent can probably share his perspective on how Fullerton came to work with many hours. Yes, uh, Chintin, this is probably my favorite slide in the deck uh, because this deck, this slide in particular talks about solution. It talks about uh, how uh, different entities can come together and find solution for our investor, for our clients. The DNA in uh, Fullerton uh, is somewhat similar to Money Hour. I think both... Uh, NTC Income, which, which is one of our two parents, as well as Tomase, they have strongly emphasized that as one of our core values, do well and do good. So doing well and doing good uh, in providing a solution that meet the needs of the masses and achieving good returns at low cost is a combination of doing well and doing good. So it is part of our DMA and and I'm really happy that uh, with this opportunity, uh, I, I, I would say I'm very honored that we have this opportunity to work on this digital solution, work, working closely with Money Hour to actually come up with a very low cost uh, retirement product solution. The second part uh, is really, um, Fulton had, um, some of you may have known, have been working on retirement solution uh, about two years already. We have partnered with uh, Standard Chartered Bank in one of the uh, series of retirement funds we launched. It's called the Heritage Funds. 
So this is one of uh, many uh, solutions that we hope to build out. Um, Chris has mentioned uh, that the CPF Life uh, is a very important pillar to form the foundation of uh, retirement savings. This is the first pillar, it's a state pension scheme. Uh, through your individual effort in terms of finding your own solution to supplement it, uh, I believe this is the second pillar. Uh, I just want to share in this forum that Fullerton is uh, very happy and looking forward to build a third pillar with like-minded uh, companies. This is what we call corporate pension scheme. That means uh, uh, we're not there yet, but in other countries like Australia and the US, corporate pension scheme is also an important third pillar so that for uh, a working population, you have three pillars to support your future needs, one from the state, one from your own savings and investment, and hopefully in time to come, uh, we will roll out a corporate pension scheme uh, uh, with as many uh, parties and, and partners as possible. Yes, indeed. Uh, so for those of you who are our corporate uh, clients uh, who you know, engage many hour to talk to your staff and do workshops on, on how they can do individual planning, uh, do engage uh, with us as well if you want to go one step further to help in implementing and doing your part in, uh, in enhancing the retirement adequacy of Singaporeans in a fit for purpose and actually conflict free manner. And this is also one area where uh, Money Hour is very proud to be working uh, with with uh, various uh, uh, partners in, in, in conceptualizing and in, that includes uh, very much uh, Fullerton as well. So on that note, uh, I think it's about time for us to maybe go into the features of the fund. Right? So you might have seen this creative of um, uh, three in one handsome man. Right? So I, I suppose the thing when you have a lady CEO, you know, you choose kind of male models and all the that's not really so but you know we are uh, but uh, it, it's just a scale to show you that uh, we, we've built some flexibility into uh, for the money our wise income just not listen talk about how different cohorts uh, might have different needs uh, may have different um, you know pressures and all that and and definitely from a financial planning point and also from investment point of view uh, that is uh, a potential uh, pay out a feature that may be able to cater for these uh, different needs. So here are three, but I'll just uh, leave to maybe uh, Vincent to share a little bit more about the conceptualization of the fund and the building block of the fund before we return to this issue of the payout options. Vincent. Mm. Yeah, so I, I have two slides on this. One is the building blocks. Uh, we chose these building blocks because each of them have a different uh, purpose and, uh, and, a, and a different role to play. The first one is we need exposure in uh, credit or corporate bonds. And here I'm talking about very high quality uh, credit. Uh, we, we want to uh, invest in instruments that give you a yield pickup. Uh, I think this is very important in the environment that we are going through uh, in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, what you have seen in the newspaper, in the media is central banks, major central banks has pushed interest rates to 0%. So having an instrument, fixed term maturity, uh, that gives you a yield uh, uh, with a very low risk of default, I think it's a very important building block to have. The second building block is uh, property. And again, this is a point that is quite unique to city states like uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, where land scarce and uh, property prices just keep going up. Buying an individual piece of property to get rental income is ideal, but it's very lumpy and it's very expensive. But buying into uh, small pieces of uh, sink weeds, I think, uh, makes perfect sense because you can put in uh, smaller units, uh, smaller dollar amount, and then you have a diversified portfolio of uh, different properties. Here, we're talking about shopping mall, uh, office properties, uh, commercial properties, warehouses data centers so it's all in one place and in a land scarce area like singapore uh, the upside for property uh, is indeed uh, very positive the third area is basically growth here the emphasis is about taking appropriate risk in a very diversified manner to capture the upside for this i have to um, bring your attention to the ongoing uncertainty and uh, trade tensions between us and china 
Uh, we've seen during Trump administration, the tension has gone up. We were all hoping that under the new President Biden, things will improve, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, President Biden, unlike President Trump, is able to bring together a coalition of like-minded uh, parties, ranging from Canada, Australia, to the entire uh, Western European countries. And they are saying the same thing. China is uh, not playing a fair trade game and we want to uh, call out their bad practices, including human rights and so on. So what it seems to us that's quite likely to continue is the tension will always be with us uh, for the medium term. Given such a difficult um, global environment, where do you invest? If you pick one region to invest in, either US or China or Europe or Japan, you really need a crystal ball to, to know uh, well ahead of time which country will succeed at the end of this uh, uh, competition, the, the, the race between China and, and the US. Uh, so a better way is really to invest in a global well-diversified uh, portfolio of equity. It is very different from uh, Sing REITs or, or the REITs that we talk about because most of these companies are growth companies uh, because they are represented by market cap. The companies that do well, their market capitalization will increase and they will have a bigger weightage. So investing in a market cap driven uh, global deficit portfolio is where we want to capture a higher return. The fourth uh, building block in terms of concepts when we bring this together is really government bonds. Government bonds is for a number of purposes. One is it is uh, for safety. Government bonds here we talk about is mainly Singapore government bonds. And if uh, at times we may need to diversify, we, we may include US government bonds, but it's almost exclusively Singapore government bonds. So Singapore government bonds is one of the uh, highest rated AAA uh, rated uh, government bonds. Unlike many countries uh, during this uh, COVID period, uh, we don't need to borrow money to uh, increase government expenditure to pay out, uh, to support the private sectors, to support families. We actually dig into our past reserves. So this is not borrowed money. This is actually hard cash reserve money that the government has set aside for rainy weather. So because of very prudent, conservative uh, way that the government has been managing their reserves, we will continue to have AAA status one of uh, fewer than 10 countries, I would say even fewer than six countries in the world that has still a triple A rating. So it is for safety and also for diversification. A government bond is a good uh, asset to own uh, when equity market becomes volatile. And if especially when it plunge, uh, government bonds would tend to do very well. So the secret is not just in the building blocks, the four building blocks which are important, but it is also in how we combine them. So the next slide you will see, we have uh, done a number of uh, simulation and we feel that a balanced portfolio with 30% uh, reading from uh, global equity on your top left, 30% in global equities, 30% in sing reads. Uh, this will be uh, overlapping exposure to both growth capital appreciation and a stable source of income with some upside that's in the form of sing reads. And on the bottom half, you can see your source of income. Uh, the source of income is going to come from your Asia bonds. Asia bonds, uh, we will be investing in Jackie, uh, uh, JP Morgan Asia Composite Index. A big part of that, uh, almost 50% of that are China bonds. These are state-owned uh, gov uh, state owned companies, uh, what we call SOE, uh, very sound uh, credit rating, and they offer very attractive yield. Uh, the interest rate level, uh, as, as you can well imagine, has all been coming down, but still they can offer us a yield of uh, around 3%. Now, of course, in the, in the far bottom right, we're talking about Singapore government bonds. So when we combine in this manner, 60% in the top half, uh, comprising equal representation of global equities, 30% and 30% in sing REITs, to give us uh, upside put, upside uh, capture as well as a good income yield. And the bottom side is really safety. This combination of 40% in safe assets, 
can give us that uh, good balance that uh, Chun Ting was talking about. So this 60-40 combination, we believe, is something that is very suitable uh, for different group of investors wanting uh, uh, capital gains at one extreme for the accumulation phase, as well as at the other extreme, when they talk about withdrawal, a stable, steady income uh, to be backed by both underlying yield as well as backed by the ability of this fund uh, to give you a decent return. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, Vincent, if I come in at this point to say that a 60-40 is really a, a, what we say a balanced uh, portfolio, right? 60% yes. equities and, and uh, 40% bonds. And from a financial uh, planning viewpoint, what we always want is for people to invest in markets and where the growth comes from really is in global equities where we have that. Uh, you know, it's about human enterprise. It's about it's about productive activity. And in fact, you look at all these sources of returns. We don't have anything like really fancy there. That we you know, like like you said, we need a crystal ball to say to say that this is going to work, or, or some you know fancy asset class and crypto and all that. You know, yeah, those those, those should not be your core meal, as it were. Right? So in the sixty forty, you get that growth you need, but at the volatility that is comfortable enough. So you have that return that can give you sufficient return for you to uh, to get a retirement income from. And then at the same time, it's in a comfortable manner because the last thing we want for you in retirement, right, is to uh, is to have something that, that promises something very much, but then, well, you get a heart attack, you know, while, while, while watching the, 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 the fund markets. And you see, we have a little bit of everything. We have global equities, we have Asian bonds, we have Singapore rates, we have government bonds, each having their own function of, of yield, overlapping functions of yield and, and growth, overlapping functions of safe haven and yield. And it's a bit like, almost like a, a you know, a balanced meal on a plate. Right? So you have mm. the balanced meal that we should have as a core staple, uh, especially older, you better make sure you eat healthily. You always have some carbohydrates, some fats, uh, some, some vegetables for you know for, for the minerals and all that that you need yeah so this is really the offering offering of a uh, uh, say offering you know it's a it's a, a, a plate you know of, of that staple that we think can deliver uh, what is needed that good combination of sustainable income as well as uh, the still having maintaining that capital appreciation without having to lose very much sleep over it so in the, in the next yeah. next slide, uh, Chuntin, uh, if you turn to the next slide, I have some data points. These are historical uh, returns uh, from 2003 to uh, 2020. It's the longest history common across these four building blocks. Uh, these are uh, data, the indices are all listed in the footnote. So over this period, uh, we have equity market returning uh, double-digit return, almost 12%, 116 in Sing dollar terms. Sing REITs uh, is a close second, uh, almost uh, it's eight plus percent. So between these two growth assets on average, we're talking about 10% return in the uh, last uh, uh, almost 17 years. Uh, the bottom half of the pie that, that you, we just shown you uh, is a source of income, is a source of uh, diversification. They have also done extremely well uh, Asia credit in that same period returned uh, above 4% and same government bonds almost 3%. Now, obviously, we uh, want to be conservative in our financial planning. Uh, these are good returns uh, from a period which is very unusual, uh, where you went through a period of multiple quantitative easing. In layman terms, what the central bank had done is they put a lot of liquidity and money to support the economy. And the byproduct of that is they push up the financial assets. So a combination of 30, 30, and 40% for credit and sink government bonds, historically would have given you a 7% handle. Uh, we're not forecasting this. Uh, we should not be making forecasts based on past track record, uh, past historical uh, performance. Our compliance team would tell us, uh, never say this, but this is a good reference point for you to think about. And as a prudent way to uh, plan for your future, plan for something that's a little bit lower than what they had done uh, in the past uh, 17 years. That's right. So from uh, as financial advisors, what we need to do is that we build that buffer for you and then we need a planning number. Right, so we need a planning number, and in but we are not going to pick that seven plus percent that you you if you, you know you can do your weighted weighted return here that Vincent also mentioned because that is probably 
um, not conservative enough. We want to always build you that buffer and all that. If if we took the same blended one and uh, maybe change some of the uh, asset classes to have a longer period, what we might feel, feel that is like in the blended period, we might be looking actually more closer to, to be very conservative and to accommodate two crises, GFC and as well as the uh, COVID crisis. And you can you can see the assumptions on our website. So we, are, we, are, we actually have a planning number. Again, this is not a... This is not a, a promise number. Uh, this is just a handle so that we have to start somewhere when it comes to planning for you. Well, how much do you save and, 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 and what can you, you may be able to expect? Right? So the planning number we use is 5.3 uh, for money hour. Right? And then, of course, after fees, it might be more on the, the 4.7 uh, level as a potential way of illustrating return. Again, I want to emphasize, as, uh, as, as we said, Dan, this is not a projection. This is not a promise. There's not expected return. So this is just a handle on which uh, we, we do that. And uh, you can then see on the next slide that I'll share, uh, we have three investment options. Right? Uh, and then three investment options, there is uh, flexibility, for you to choose according to what you need. And these three investment options will be dividends reinvested. So it is the uh, intention that we we'll try as much as possible to pay, uh, fund manager will try to pay 4.5% uh, per annum of portfolio value. And, uh, and of portfolio value, this, this dividend as it were, you if you choose this option, it will be automatically reinvested for you. So if you're using SRS, this is the only option that's available for you because SRS is unable to receive uh, cash distributions. Second option is this, to receive this as a dividend payout, so into your account on a quarterly basis. So take fit four point, if it's 4.5, is then you divide it by 4, 1.125% uh, of, uh, of the portfolio value again. And then the third option, it will be 8%. So this 8% will be obviously drawing on a combination of your actual capital and but firstly, with return, right? With return and yield. So uh, this is a decumulation option. So you can expect that the your principal amount, your investment portfolio value will be going down over time. And because it's 8% of portfolio value, your payout is also going down over time. And, and this is where for people who don't want to leave, leave such a, don't need to leave a big legacy and but you want to maximize your income. So three options again. Now on the 4.5%, uh, maybe I emphasize again, it is uh, not a guaranteed amount because as the portfolio manager, we'll want to safeguard safeguard the, 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 the unit holder's interest in extreme conditions. So this is what is the intention. And uh, perhaps you, you've heard us say a little bit of the historical and it's not something that we can we, we can promise, but we did size this 4.5% uh, in discussion between Fulton and Manuel to be sustainable, to be what we believe that is be sustainable because we are not here to sell you something just with a very big number. And then in the end, it, it's, it's not a sustainable number. Second thing I want to point out is it's our portfolio value. Why is this so? We talk a little bit about sequence of returns risk. We talk about overspending risk as well, right? So when when the payout is a percentage of of the portfolio value, it means that there is some volatility in that. But remember, this is additional income, so it is uh, you have your paycheck in that sense for CPF life. Your play check, you know, can come from something like this. And if you can accept some volatility uh, in in the actual quantum there, because that comes with the portfolio value, but it helps to safeguard that portfolio. And it is one way in which withdrawal helps to mitigate the sequence of returns risk. So let's now I turn over to Vincent to give some illustrations of how uh, some of these options uh, might work out. Yes. So uh, I will go through three illustrations. Uh, I guess it's always good to have actual numbers in front of you. So in the first option that we talk about, uh, as an illustration, I assume that the uh, return that this portfolio can deliver is 4.7% per annum. Now, I think earlier on, I, I spoke about the rule of 72. How long it would take uh, for the money to double? It just takes 72 divided by 4.7. The number you come to is close to 15 years. So for an investor uh, investing in uh, accumulation share class uh, with no distribution, your hundred thousand dollar of capital will double to two hundred thousand in fifteen years, and in year thirty, another fifteen years, it will almost double again to three hundred ninety six thousand. So from one hundred thousand, it will all grow to almost four times that, three hundred ninety six thousand over a thirty year period. 
Now, in the second option, where you have a payout of 4.5%, this is what the, the, the illustration is uh, showing us. Each year, assuming a par value at 100,000, the individual can receive $4,500. And uh, if you receive this over a period of uh, 30 years, it will bring you to about 140,000 of interest that's been taken out already. Now, the fund is growing at a faster rate than 4.5%, and that is why at the end of the period, you still have projected capital gains. So 140,000 is what the investor will receive year after year, about 4,500 uh, per year. And at the end of the 30-year period, he will receive another 102,000 in principle, bring the total uh, to almost 245,000, 246,000. This is 4.5% payout. So the capital value does not drop below par. You can continue to still keep growing at a smaller rate uh, after paying away 4.5%. The decumulation share class, which is the last illustration, this will be no surprise to you because uh, a lot of the money are being taken out uh, from both uh, the growth of the fund as well as the capital value of the fund. So in this case, each year, 8,000 is being taken out, um, pay out over a 30-year period. Uh, we will see that uh, this individual choosing the decumulation share class or withdrawal uh, share class will accumulate a lot more payment through uh, the yearly uh, distribution, a total of 153,000. Uh, there's a smaller, the trade-off is a smaller capital value at the end of the 30-year period, 36,000. So in total, the decumulation share class will give you uh, the individual in this illustration about $186,000 uh, starting from 100,000. So these three illustrations hopefully will give you an idea depending on uh, what is the payout that the individual need. Uh, and again, this depends on, on his own personal financial life cycle. Uh, whether a 4.5% payout works better or 8% payout works better. This hopefully you can take back as your reference so that you can do your own calculation uh, around it. Yes, and actually you don't need to do that because on uh, Money Hours website, moneyhour.com.sg uh, slash rise income, which I could ask my colleagues to put it into the Facebook chat, we actually develop a nice calculator together with the you know a, a nice graph to to try to, try to uh, give you an idea again not guaranteed right not representation or that and uh, we do as want you to speak to our advisor if you need any of this uh, help to uh, understand especially for eight uh, percent we will give you a call to because we, we, we do not want you to get the wrong idea about about what that you know is a promise guarantee with, with your with your uh, habitable intact but it it can work, these three options can work according to uh, your needs, your priorities. And I'll show you now uh, maybe two examples of how wise income can be in action in a financial plan, which our advisors can uh, help you to put together as well. So first example A, uh, we call it a three-stage retirement plan. Uh, and maybe if you can follow me here. So Mr. Tan, uh, at 40 years old, he is investing $100,000. And over time, as it grows, if we have using the same return assumptions previously, it grows towards two hundred and fifty-six thousand dollars. Now, I just took a peek at the uh, the comments or the questions they have, and there's a question of whether there is a minimum holding period. I want to clarify: this is not like an insurance product where you have an accumulation period, and if you withdraw at any time, uh, you you have huge you incur huge huge costs uh, and all that. Now, this is not so. Now, you may lose money because you do not know at, at, at which point you withdraw or you may gain money. So it depends on that. Now, what we don't recommend to you, uh, like we recommend for all accumulators, is that stay invested according to your plan. And for a balanced fund, uh, we very conservatively ask that you have about an eight-year uh, time horizon period. Okay, so uh, no lock in. So this is the, the, the return profile might, might, might be something you've seen before in an insurance plan, but this is not an insurance plan. There is no lock in. Okay, so in this case, Mr. Tan, 40 years old, not yet retiring, retiring in 20 years' time. So he puts his money and it grows. And then what happens is that, okay, I want to retire now. And then he switches 
to the 4.5% option because there is the flexibility of the fund. And the portfolio value at 256,000, he will draw 4.5% per annum. And over time, we do expect that more or less the portfolio value uh, should be preserved. We've also done uh, various simulations of different sequence of returns. And uh, we, we, we're confident that given the underlying portfolio, uh, and also actually we're doing a very conservative uh, kind of uh, planning number uh, that this should preserve portfolio value, and this is what he gets in terms of per quarter dividends. Now, say come around 80, you know, and maybe he does the 4.5% because he came to our webinar and he remember Chris saying that, you know, when people retire, they tend to overspend. So to discipline himself, he said, okay, I'm just going to choose the 4.5% first, right? Do not draw down too quickly. But around 80, maybe for some uh, other needs, and he said, okay, you know, uh, I, I want to, I want to uh, move into a, uh, a nice uh, smaller place, but I want to um, do something special and, and who knows that what that might be. It might be a charity work or might, might be starting something uh, and, and he wants to maximize his income. So he then receives a higher payout, but the portfolio value will start to decline. And roughly we're talking about a half-life of about 15 years under our uh, central scenario. And if the half-life is indeed 15 years, then if he passes away at age 95, then he might still be able to pass on uh, a legacy of $125,000, roughly half of this, uh, still some above $100,000 in this particular scenario. So if this works for you, this is one way in which wise income can be put into action. The second example, uh, perhaps more um, uh, like like our uh, like like Sam uh, from Fullerton, you know, who has been a partner in this. He said he's a uh, traditional uh, Asian, uh, don't really live in this this uh, angmo thing of you know not leaving something for the family. So and let's say, let's say Sam retires today, you know. Uh, actually, his surname is not Lim, uh, but it's assumed that Sam retires, you know, and he wants to uh, get that 4.5% uh, payout. He invests 300000 And so what he will get every quarter is 3375 And then by age 85, as part of legacy planning, simple legacy planning, uh, put your grandchild into your joint account. And the uh, because, the, I mean, there are, there are certain, certain conditions uh, to do approach our, our staff if we wish to do that. And uh, basically passes on this come for the portfolio value and then there of course there are opportunities to switch to different examples here as well so this is really a wise income in a financial plan which our uh, financial advisor can help you to uh, assess based on uh, what you actually want to do and for your plans for legacy as well as for uh, income okay so if i can just move on because everybody was asking Oh, okay, where, 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 what, what do I do? Where do I buy? How much do I pay? Okay, so fees are always a question, and we are always very happy uh, to answer questions on fees. I, I, I think it's very important. I think there's more transparency nowadays in investing in Singapore. There are a number of fees or charges, right? Some are upfront and some are inbuilt into your fund. And for there is one charge called sales charge for financial advisors uh, in the industry. There's tend to be about two percent or so. In many hours, we we don't ever charge a sales charge. Okay, for advisory fees or rep fee, so this is the per annum charge. And what do you pay your advisor for doing? In this charge, you pay your advisor for doing the work of the asset allocation, explaining the product to you, uh, when, when things go up and down, what's happening. In our case, well, we, we actually make it, uh, you know, structuring the product together with uh, Fullerton and we monitor the performance of the fund. We talk to the fund manager about what's happening on this and very importantly, risk coaching. You know, when the markets are going up or down because of what Winston said, because of trade tensions and all that, how do we read that? And then we remind you about the evidence of the markets, about long-term investing and, and even help you to build some psychological strength, you know, in terms of like, you know, when there's sometimes a dry powder, as we told our clients last year, maybe it's about time to consider putting in. Well, these are all, this is all part of the advice and uh, it's very much uh, quite human. Uh, it's, 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 it comes from the point of safeguarding your financial plan, right? And uh, so, so these are, uh, I, I digress. So rep fees uh, in the market uh, uh, tend to be with traditional uh, advisors about 1%. But for many hours, our standard rate is 0.5 to 0.6%, but currently we have a promotion of half of these fees is the per annum uh, basis fees. Platform fees, now it's paid to uh, platforms. So platforms uh, perform certain uh, functions of a custodian as well as putting in trades and all that. And these, uh, some of the names are Navigator, IFAS, and 
and so on. And the money hours platform is IFAS. Um, they, if, if you went through a financial advisor, you pay 22 basis points, 0.22% per annum. How many hours absorbs this fee? Now, fund management fee, there's some fund level expenses and one of the core components is the fund management fee. Now, the fund management fee in the industry of, of funds tends to be 1%. Because this is just general funds. Multi-asset funds actually is tends to be even higher for various reasons. But here, this is not something that you see as it is deducted in terms of units like the like the advisory fees, it is inbuilt in the performance of the funds. And many a time we see funds underperform because expenses are too high. And uh, I'll, I'll ask Vincent to maybe share a little bit more about that. But at this point, what I want to say is that uh, money hours, uh, the rise income fund, the fund management fee is at 0.4% per annum. And this is really the lowest among those, I, I think I dare say it's actually the lowest among uh, multi asset funds of this kind of quality in Singapore. And uh, this is uh, this is what is paid to Fullerton uh, and is inbuilt and its impact is reflected in the performance of the fund. So I want to turn over to Vincent to tell us uh, how is it that Fullerton is managing to keep this um, management fee low. Mm. Thanks, Shinji. Now, before I go into the uh, explanation how we partner to uh, bring down the, the low cost, uh, I just want to also reiterate the point that for a balanced uh, fund of this nature, bringing together four building blocks, uh, typically in the industry, uh, the fees that are charged by the fund manager is between 1.2 to 1.5%. Uh, so what we have agreed, uh, because we share the motivation, the thinking that this is a product that really meet the needs of uh, many, many investors, a low cost solution. Uh, that is the reason why we have actually uh, come to this agreement, uh, very low cost, and we want to play our part. So as a fund manager uh, for this product, uh, we'll be charging only 0.4%, not the 1.2 to 1.5% uh, that you get from the industry. Now, specifically on this slide, uh, how do we play our part in terms of keeping the cost as low as possible? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Fullerton now manages uh, more than $60 billion of assets. This has its advantage because when we set up a fund, uh, some of the uh, costs, the fixed costs, uh, can be brought down because we have the advantage of size. So when we set up a fund, one of the things that is uh, quite expensive is your annual lodgement, your legal fees, and your custody fees. Your custodian will do all the calculation uh, of your unit price, and after the deduction on uh, dividend distribution, how much uh, is, is, is been uh, kept in, in the balance. All this have to be properly calculated, no mistakes made, audited. So with a larger pool of assets, we have the power to actually negotiate a lower lower total custody charge and that actually appear as an expense item in the fund. The other advantage that we have uh, as a large fund manager is uh, when we start up this fund, if you start a, a, a fund with uh, $1,000 or $1 million, the cost when it's distributed over such a small base, such a small AUM will be very punitive because the fixed cost doesn't change but if we spread over a bigger uh, AUM asset under management, then the cost to unit holder will, will drop substantially. So to make the cost uh, manageable from day one, uh, our management from Fullerton uh, has injected a seed capital. The seed capital is there to defray and reduce the total expense ratio at the beginning stage uh, when the fund is being built up so that by the time the AUM reach a sizable, uh, 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 large enough uh, <clears throat> uh, size, then the unit cost will be uh, much lower. So this seed funding is very unusual. Uh, it is only possible because uh, Fullerton management can commit uh, this amount uh, for this social program that we want to do together with uh, Money Hour. The second point is typically uh, the fund manager's fee is actually shared uh, with the distributor, this is what we call the trailer or the retro section. So in the case of uh, arrangement with Money Hour, uh, this is taken away and that is one of the reasons why our fees dropped to 40 basis points. The third reason is 
to minimize the uh, cost of managing the portfolio, we have chosen to use very low uh, passive uh, building blocks, what we call ETFs or passive index funds. Uh, we do this for the global equities. Uh, even though uh, it is uh, a low tracking error risk, very little active management, we're buying the index, we're buying the market, there will still be that amount of uh, replication costs, custody fees, and so on. So we will look for the very uh, uh, good quality funds, passive funds, uh, that charge a very low expense ratio. Uh, in areas that we can actually add value, what uh, Fullerton has done is we bring the uh, passive indexation in-house. I can give you two examples. Uh, one is Seng Reeds. We already have a team of uh, uh, analysts and portfolio manager that actually invest in Seng Reeds in an active manner. But for Money Hour, uh, we actually uh, track a very passive exposure to a Seng Reeds index. Uh, we do this in a way uh, without charging any additional cost. Because we're buying into the actual uh, position, let's say the index has 15 uh, sing reads uh, counter, we buy into each of the 15 names according to the weightage of the index, then you can have a full replication of the behavior of this, uh, this component. But when we do it this way, uh, we enter the market and we construct a portfolio, we're not creating a fund, therefore we do away with the additional uh, expense ratio that you will have to pay as investor if you buy the ETF. So by bringing it in-house, we eliminate this cost in building the Singwits uh, portfolio. Similarly, when we buy into uh, Singapore government bonds, we're buying into individual government bonds uh, holdings to provide us that diversification, that safety, uh, safe haven asset class. For these two components, the Singwits and Sing government bonds, we take it in-house we build the portfolio, we build the component parts, and we're not charging any additional costs. Uh, so basically it comes free of charge. The last part uh, really is uh, uh, what I just uh, mentioned already. We do uh, full replication, but we will also recognize that there is some periods in which the market uh, will go through some volatility. And this is where uh, we've spoken to Money Hour to give us a little bit of bandwidth to reduce risk or increase risk a little bit uh, within the limits that the fund uh, prescribed so that we can uh, help improve performance at the margin. Now for that, uh, that is all part of the uh, total package uh, for the 40 basis points. So these are the four elements in which we can uh, do our part to keep the cost of the fund uh, affordable. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Vincent. So, in fact, we are very uh, grateful to Fullerton for really uh, coming alongside in partnership for uh, launching this product for uh, the mass market and keeping costs low, and, and uh, really trying to add value. You know how to squeeze that, squeeze the down the cost. You know, be and, and add value. You know through this uh, structure. Well, most of the time, structures actually don't add value. You know, they just add cost. But in this case, for wise income, it is indeed uh, that. Um, the intentionality that was there and in, in for practical uh, uh, expertise in operationalizing it, which is why I, we were ha happy with Fullerton to do this. I do, have a, I do have a slide to actually explain the importance of this uh, fee saving, which is uh, in front of you now. So uh, let me explain the table and then I can relate it to you. So in the bottom two rows, uh, you assume the 4.5% payout per annum and an 8% payout for the decumulation share class. In the vertical columns, uh, I assume a net return, net of all charges, either 3%, 4%, 5%, 6%, or 7%. So in each of the box there, what it shows there is how long it takes for the fund value when you start at $100 to drop to half its value. From $100, it declined to uh, $50. If you take the... Uh, First column and first row, a 3% return and with 4.5% payout, it will take approximately 40 years for the value of your investment to reduce by half. Now, the second column, 4% return, net return, uh, it, it really increased the longevity of your fund. We're talking about longevity risk of individuals now, we're talking about the fund itself. It will take almost 96 years for the fund to drop in half 
of its original uh, investment value. Why do I pick out these two numbers? Uh, earlier on in one of the slides, uh, Chunting showed uh, uh, what is an average uh, market industry total fee uh, when, you, when you include the front end fees and all those things. Let's say it comes to an average of, let's say, 1.5%. Let's say Fullerton is charging 0.5%. Uh, 40, 40 basis points is our management fee. There could be some uh, custody fees. Let's run up to 50 basis points, 0.5% compared to 1.5%. Now, if the fund uh, run a general uh, rate of return at 4.5%, if you had paid a 1.5% fee per annum, 4.5 less 1.5 will give you that first column, 3% return, net of all fees. If you had chosen a low cost solution or in half a percent instead of 1.5 percent then you subtract 0.5 percent from the 4.5 percent return of the fund you end up with the third column which is four percent net return simply by saving one percent fee uh, you actually allow the longevity of the fund uh, to go up from 40 years to 96 years for the 4.5 percent distribution share class so this impact is tremendous. It is more important uh, even for the 8% uh, payout because when we run uh, in a good scenario, when we run like in the previous 13 years, a 7% handle return after, after fees, you can even at the 8% uh, drawdown, you can still keep the fund at half its original value after 40 years. That's the bottom right-hand cell. So when explaining the fees, what is the impact? Uh, this hopefully illustrate a difference of 1% could mean that you're stretching your dollar from 40 years to 96 years in the case of the 4.5% payout. And even in the 8% payout, you can stretch all the way in a good scenario to 40 years. So that really go a long way in helping you enjoy your retirement. Mm. Yeah, I, I hope this uh, this slide is really uh, very enlightening to me, you know, and it really sh sh shows you again, you know, why is it that we have certain proposed construction and at the same time, we are not really promising this fund is like going to be the highest return, you know, there are a lot of multi-asset funds that will promise you, you the sky. But what we want to do is something that is sustainable, realistic, uh, we, again, not a guarantee. So when I use that planning number 4.7% as illustration, we are looking into, you know, what, what it could be if we really took away uh, all those fees that we uh, we know, you know, which is 0.4, and then maybe we add another uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 for other expenses and money hours fees and, and all that, right? So I think if you, if you need any more help on this, uh, please do contact our advisors. But ultimately, where, where we're coming from is we low fees so that you get more payouts, so that you have if you have that more sustainable uh, uh, retirement income stream. So at this point, maybe just to summarize these features, so we've come together to co-design this uh, from companies that understand uh, retirement, Singapore retirement and investing needs. We put together this multi-asset fund so that there are different sources of return uh, to give you both income as well as capital growth to support the income, flexible payout options, and very importantly, low cost. And uh, we're running a little bit short on time, so I'll just quickly summarize uh, from all that uh, Chris has shared with us and uh, Vincent has shared with us uh, and, and myself as well on, on the, on the, in the last uh, one plus hours. There are three must-haves and five retirement uh, risks when it comes to retirement. But these uh, retirement needs should be addressed holistically. Do not address financial planning from a product standpoint alone. We, it is usually you will miss something. We address them holistically and this is really where our passion is as comprehensive financial planners at Money Hour. How holistically? Government schemes first as the foundation for your basic needs. In our comprehensive planning, we do your projection from you using our CPF analyzer, proprietary analyzer we're very proud of. So even if, if you can't use the, the, the CPF website quickly, we project what this might be. What is this safe retirement income for, for Singaporeans? Then we use insurance in its right place for protection, right, to as an additional coverage of the risk uh, um, on top of government insurance schemes. So that could be casual life for, for, for long-term care costs or medical life and perhaps other insurance as well. Low cost, term, uh, no, sorry, low cost medical expense insurance for life uh, and then the other insurance as is fit for purpose. And thirdly, for investments, for additional layer of uh, income, we provide buffers and options. 
And so what does money, our, uh, sorry, for the money, our wise income, how does it come in? Well, firstly, it just complements your CPF life payout for a sustainable stream of additional income. What this means for you is a more meaningful retirement. At a 60-40 allocation and with the various building blocks from the various asset classes there that we've curated, uh, the money our wise, for the money our wise income fund provides sufficient return but at a comfortable level and this means for you a comfortable investing in retirement experience. It caters to different payout needs, accumulation, income and legacy and what this means is that you have flexibility when your life goals change. And you do all this at low cost with two partners with strong heritage. And this means that you can have greater assurance that this works for your financial planning needs. And finally, to access the money our wise income, we, uh, we have a combination of our comprehensive conflict free human advice augmented by technology through our platform. So this means you can take the next steps easily towards a better retirement and with confidence. So at this point, we've come to the end of the presentations. And thank you so much for your patience in listening to us with so many statistics and slides. And now we move into our q and Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Chun Ting. Thanks, Vincent. I, brought, I just brought Chris up back to the stage. Uh, so I'll be moderating this session uh, tonight. Uh, my name is Sherry, and I'm from the marketing team at Money Hour. Um, so we do have a lot of questions coming in. Most of it are operational. Um, that our efficient money our representative have already answered them uh, but we would like to actually run through some of the questions that have been raised uh, one of it i'm actually personally very curious for is this so what is the difference between this fund uh, money our wise income fund as well as the current dfa fund other than the fund components and the payout so i'd like to direct this question to chun ting and then maybe vincent can add on to this I don't think Vincent will comment on the current <laughs> additional funds. Uh, maybe Chris can come add on it. But um, yes, okay. So uh, yes, indeed, Money Hour has also we we, cur we curate our funds according to your financial planning need. We we don't like you know spray a variety and ask you to choose and put it. At you are not eating a hot pot. You are eating a, you're having a retirement uh, plan. Our dimensional funds generally speaking, are accumulation portfolios in different uh, risk profiles. Now, if you are then, so the, one of the questions I need to ask you is, are you an accumulator? Or are you looking uh, for withdrawal? But uh, dimensional funds, the way that we've curated them, they are market-based funds. So we follow the broad markets. So like for instance, that, you know, sometimes you can never have a crystal ball. And we so we find that correct combination uh, according to your need, ability, and willingness to take risk of equities and bonds. We take the uh, dimensional takes the broad market index and based on academic research backed by both theory and evidence, tilt them towards the dimensions of higher return, which are actually small caps value and profitability. So I said all this very quickly and I'm very sorry, but basically it is a broad market based return, it's, uh, what we call evidence based uh, investing. Now, so if you are accumulating, uh, the, the the cost of this of dimensional funds tend to be lower as well. So the overall handle is more the thirty basis point. So so so, uh, so that's one thing. But again, return and cost is probably not the main thing. It's really about the the, the needs, like I said. Right? So if you are looking, wise income is really meant for uh, withdrawal. Right? And so if you want to use dimensional fund for withdrawal, you can. So our uh, Financial advisors can go through with you. What you do is you invest in the 60-40 and then you redraw. So let me address, is a dimensional redrawal better or is this wise income redrawal better? Okay. So firstly, in terms of the, the way that the fund is constructed, one is actually an accumulating fund and you need to apply a redrawal rule, say a 4% redrawal rule. You need to have that uh, discipline to apply it right? and you need to sort of uh, do it yourself as it were. The, we also believe that should give you a sustainable stream of income for at least 30 years or, or, or more. And this is based on our modeling and also on international research. If you withdraw from wise income, what happens is that firstly, that is an in, the, it, the withdrawal feature is inbuilt, right? And this, this actually helps people because it makes it easy. It makes it easy to, 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 to turn on. Uh, it makes it gives that discipline, you know, that you will withdraw it for over the end and end at, at the portfolio. Uh, portfolio percentage. So this is one. And 
you, you notice I didn't describe the investment part, right? I described actually the uh, features because a lot of times financial planning and investment is about discipline and is about how you handle uh, the, the cash flow. Okay. Secondly, in terms of the a way that the, the fund the fund is built is about reliability and sufficiency across both funds. As an accumulating portfolio in the main, the 60-40 dimensional fund, right, it is really about having that uh, broad-based equity and then with the volatility dampened by global equity, uh, global bonds, the 40% cheap global bonds. In wise income, the 40% on fixed income is Asian credit, and then you get some income also from REITs, which is, which is from the equities, technically the equities portion, and also uh, Singapore government bonds. Now, what, what's the difference there? The difference is that, remember in redrawal, what you want is the reliability of income. And so when it comes to reliability of income, uh, you, there is the inbuilt yield feature. Whereas in global bonds, as Vincent has said, you know, global bonds, REITs, yields are very, very low. So the income, in a sense, the if the, the the feature that is the total return of the bonds and it is not so much on the yield. Now, when it comes to, when you select bonds for yield and inbuilt yield feature so that you have greater confidence that you get at least that yield, right? What's the most important thing? The bond doesn't default. The read is okay. You know? And this is where we make use of Fullerton's um, fund management activities to almost risk manage for us, right? To make sure that you, that you, you select the bonds because the most important thing for the reliable income, that source of income in the fund is that not. Right? So this is, this is where the difference. So the asset class difference is, is, is in the sense of in the in the bonds portion. And the, what, what, what is it? It relates back to the need, the financial planning function of the fund. So I encourage you to speak to your uh, advisor about that. But for accumulation, if you want to use wise income, I, I think it is, it is, it is also a good instrument and it's fair enough instrument. You can think about it as sort of diversifying a little bit because maybe global bonds, you feel that you know we are in a kind of unprecedented situation on, on, on global bond market with yields being historical low and all that. You, you, can, you can consider in that sense a, a second strategy on top of that if you are in a, in a balance fund. Now, again, need ability, willingness to take risk if you are accumulation, if you are not suitable for a 60 40, uh, please, don't, please don't buy the, the balance fund okay? uh, in, in accumulation. Chris, do you want to add on? Yeah, I should add on to let uh, Chun Ting and Vincent rest a bit. They have been working really hard for the last one and a half hours. And first of all, thank you very much for the near 200 who stayed with us. I don't want to repeat what uh, Chun Ting has said because she has said enough about the difference between the dimensional portfolios and uh, Fullerton. But I just want to say this, that firstly, both are built for different purpose, really. I mean, the dimensional portfolios, when we first built it, it is really for accumulation. And um, I know, Gabriel, you asked one question. I'm trying to answer that question or add on to that answer. Um, I hope you are happy with our dimensional because uh, they have done their job. But as you notice, you know, when we decided to work with Fullerton for wise income, the focus really is on income. And that's why you see the underlying asset classes are uh, uh, things that gives you income. But of course, we know people, you know, that uh, um, they want to invest in this fund, even though it is meant for income, because they like things like REITs, they like things like Asian bonds. And so that's why we give you an option to reinvest it. But the purpose is really more for income. And Gabriel asked that question, you know, that on, well, I've invested in dimensional and when I am near retirement, do I then switch to wise income? And if I switch, then when? Well, you can switch to wise income if you want to. If uh, what you want, like what Chun Ting say, is a consistent drawdown of about 4.5%, that's fine. But if you think that your retirement will be one whereby in the beginning years, you're going to spend a bit more and then later part in the middle, you may spend a bit less. You want to have that discretion. Then you can, of course, stay invested with uh, Dimensional as well and do that drawdown accordingly. The last point that I really want to say is that we have been talking about products for the last two hours. But retirement planning is not just about products. Products are just, are just there to enable your goals. And you know, when we plan for retirement, it's 20 years away. A lot of things change after 20 years. Markets will change. Um, returns may change. 
your needs will change, you know, circumstances change. And so at that point, when you are about to decide between dimensional, whether I should switch to wise income, you have a decision to make and it depends on your circumstances, right? And it depends even on your financial assets at that point in time. Let me give you an example. So maybe you have enough cash, you have other things beyond wise income and dimensional, you have got money sitting in the ordinary account, you have cash, and you might want to, well, you know, only switch when you need wise income. You may want to draw down from your OA first, for example, right? And so at that point in time, you will talk to your advisor. And that is really why we have advisors in our team, because it is not just as simple as I put it into the robo and then it runs and I pay 4.5% and I live happily ever after. Retirement planning is not like that, right? And so when your needs change, your circumstances change, then you speak to your advisor and you say, look, I'm like that now. And I've got these other things besides the wise income that I have with your, or the dimensional that I have your, should I then switch to wise income or should I draw down from other places first? Should I draw down from dimensional instead of switching to wise income? you make those decisions 20 years, 25 years later, uh, not now. Yeah. So I hope that gives you sort of like an understanding of whether we should uh, switch. But the advisor is very important because he is the one that is going to help you make those decisions. And especially if you are with this advisor for a while, uh, he will understand you a lot better because he has been journeying with you. You have that discussion 20, 30 years down the road. So I hope that, yeah, that answers that question. Yeah, yeah Sherry, back to you. So in fact, if I just add one point, you know, this is the first time that Fullerton has done a fund that has a partner name in it, I believe, the Fullerton Money Hour Wise Income Fund. And Money Hour also, in a sense, we're also taking a step of stage to uh, to create a product, you know, and put our name into it. Because why is this so true? I said at the beginning, because we are here to journey with you. We, we want, we have our partners, we have the heritage, we have the parentage of the heritage. And, and a commitment to for retirement. And so, and that's, that's really why we dare to do this. So, why the decision to do this for money hour in the wise income. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Very. Thanks, thanks for sharing. Yeah, so uh, lead on to the next question. Someone is actually curious because um, wise income is a new fund, so they're curious mm -hmm. with no track record. So how do we know if it can perform or able to beat its benchmark? Also, will there be a risk of the fund no longer being around for the longer term and hence affect the retirement slash withdrawal plan? Yeah. So maybe between Chris or Chun Ting, uh, yeah. you guys can take it up. So I, told, I told Cherry that I will volunteer for this question. It's a tough question. It's yes. harder for Vincent to answer. Yeah, answer it's a question that people will, will naturally be curious about. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to start first by saying that Fullerton is a credible fund manager. I mean, we are Singaporeans and we know that it's owned by Tamasic and the reputation is there. And of course, I, I mean, we all see Vincent. He looks like a really credible fund manager. Uh, I know the CIO, the CIO of Fullerton is my personal friend. So I know that it is a credible fund manager, but whatever we say tonight doesn't matter because I can say everything good about um, um, this fund. I can say everything good about Fullerton. There is always that possibility that the, the fund may not perform. There is always that possibility whereby for whatever reason, like what the question have asked that, well, the fund manager may not be around. It's possible, of course it's possible. So I just want to be very neutral and say that this is why money hour is in this. And ultimately, it is not just for the turn. It is every fund that we bring to you. You will notice that after so long, we have only have got dimensional and now we have full turn. We are not in a hurry to try and bring many funds to you because we need to be prudent and we need to be confident enough because you're putting your money, your hard-earned money and the result will only happen maybe in the next 10, 20 years, right? So, to me, our job, we owe this fiduciary duty to you as a client to watch the performance of the fund manager. And for whatever reason, any fund managers do not perform up to standard, including dimensional. Then for us at Money Hour, we owe it to you to change the fund manager. It is possible. 
Okay, it is possible if a fund do not perform, even though we co-create that fund, to switch out from that fund into another fund. Okay, I have done it before in my career. We have created a fund, but it underperforms. Okay, and over time we we slowly switch out the fund in agreement with the fund manager, and then when the fund size becomes so small, we close the fund. So that is our responsibility uh, to all of you. I hope that gives you uh, some uh, assurance. Yeah. Can Can I take a step and answering that question? Sure, uh, just don't scold me, Vincent. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> thanks, thanks for giving us the credit. I I just want to put it in two contexts. Um, in terms of uh, um, uh, track record, um, uh, I think it's very important, but. Trade record has to be seen in the context of the market environment. Uh, I've been uh, doing investment for more than 30 years, uh, spent 25 years uh, uh, running GIC, a part of GIC money. So that one is for intergeneration wealth uh, funds, trans wealth transfer. So that one is even a longer horizon. But because there's such a long horizon, it also allows us to really examine uh, different periods of uh, market cycles and this is something where even track record itself would not be sufficient to give you uh, comfort or, or to give you any sense of how it would turn out. I, I, I can give you all these numbers because I'm very familiar with the cycles I studied. Um, the equity market is the part that will swing the fund's performance uh, much more than the fixed income part because volatility in the equity market are a large, uh, I think about four times bigger than a credit market. Now the equity market goes through what we call secular trends, secular bull markets, secular bear markets. Secular bull markets, if you go all the way uh, back to the 1900s, I'll start with the most famous one, secular bear market with the Great Depression. It was a 20 year secular bear market from 1929 to 1949. If, you, if any fund had invested and started their track record in that 20 year, two decade period, it would be very difficult to actually come out with a good uh, track record, even for the best of managers. Then what happened is that after the World War II, um, <clears throat> you have um, the US economy going to a, what we call baby boomers, golden years, you have a secular bull market that stretched for 15 years, 1950 to 1965. Then we went through another 15 years of secular bear markets from 1965 to 1979. 1970s were two oil shocks. It caused the equity market to struggle. I came into the uh, industry in the, in the 1980s and I fully enjoyed a 20 year, a two decade of secular bull market from 1980 to 1999. Then you have 10 years of secular bear market, 2000 to 2009. And since then, we have a good 10 years of equity bull market, secular bull market. A secular market is different from a cyclical market because in one secular trend, you can have two business cycle. So the reason to bring this up is that the track record, any fund managers, even for my case, with 30 years in the marketplace, I only have seen through two phases. Secular bull market, 1980 to 99, and secular bear market, and now the question mark is, are we in a secular bull market? So the track record has to be uh, judged in that context. We do our best in the environment that is given to us. So that's the first point. Uh, the second point is really about uh, return is unpredictable, but cost is something that is very tangible and you can manage. Because this product is designed to be low cost, it is something you put in your pocket already. Because if you buy an alternative fund, even, even a better fund manager than, uh, than us, for example, he will have to do 1% better per annum for the next 30 years. Now that is a very tall order because for fund manager to actually accumulate 1% per annum more than a competitor for a stretch of 30 years is almost impossible. So the Forward-looking view is uh, always uncertain, but what we know is that we will do our best, but what you as investor already have in your pocket is a low-cost solution that works to your advantage. Just those two points. 
Nice, nice. Speaking of the bull and the bear market, it's a really nice transition to the next question that I would like to ask. Uh, so Ramu asks, how would the payout work when the interest rate starts going up and the bond portion loses value? Also, how would the payout work in the bear market scenario? Mm. Yeah. Uh, let me let me take that. Uh, when I when I started in the industry, our rule of thumb and financial theory tells us. As interest rate goes up, stock market will go down. Uh, we learn in financial theory, dividend discount model, uh, cost, of the, cost of capital goes up, uh, price of the risk asset will go down. This was completely reversed from 2000 to 2020. Why? Because we were in, a, again, the environment has changed completely. Inflation no longer exists. By that, I mean inflation is very, very low. Uh, below 2%. When inflation is so low, the driver of interest rates and growth and an equity market is actually a common driver, which is economic growth. When you have economic growth, it allows both interest rates and the stock market to go up at the same time. Whereas in the previous uh, two decades from 1980 to 1999, when you have a combination of both growth and inflation, Sometimes the driver will cause the relationship between interest rate and stock market to be inverted, meaning higher interest rates, uh, weaker stock market. But in the environment that we're in, higher interest rates tend to lead to, and is the result of stronger growth, therefore it tends to reflect it, be reflected in the form of higher stock market. Now, to complicate things a little bit matter, uh, a little bit more, uh, is the recent jump in interest rates of uh, 10-year bond yields in US went from 0.6% to 1.6%. That caused the market to have some volatility. But guess what? If you look beyond that three months of volatility in the stock market, the S&P is actually higher than where it was at the beginning of the year. And this is when interest rate has gone up. So in general, our observation is in period of rising interest rate in the environment that we're in, uh, stock market would normally do better because it is, it is a common growth that's driving both assets up, uh, interest rates up uh, and, and stock market up. So in the bear market, how can the fund perform? This is where the diversification element comes in. Um, we have seen in case studies that in bear markets, certain sectors uh, would tend to do better. This is what we call defensive sector, utility companies. In the case of REITs, uh, we've studied very carefully what happened in Japan because Japan had went through a period of uh, negative inflation, negative interest rates. And in those periods, actually the Japanese uh, real estate investment trust outperformed the broad index, the broad equity market. It is very unusual uh, we're not 100% uh, certain the same thing would be happening in Singapore, but we have a fair amount of confidence that investors in this region looks at REITs as if it is half a bond market. The other half, hopefully, it, it has the ability to grow itself, rejuvenate itself. If you take um, a shopping mall near the uh, capital area, I, I, I think Funan Centre, I think if you look at it five years ago and now, it's completely transformed. There is growth in REITs, but equally important is they have a stable yield coming from the uh, rental yield. So two thirds of the portfolio, uh, meaning Asia Credit, Singapore government bonds, and S REITs, all together form 70% of portfolio. This portion is very defensive. It would do well when equity market is in a bear market but it may not be sufficient to completely avoid capital loss. This is where your advisor would need to uh, have the journey with you. You cannot pick the cycle all the time. Uh, Sometimes what is important is to stay invested and ride through the cycle as long as the portfolio itself is well diversified. Yeah, so if I can add, I think in terms of the payout, maybe just to clarify that the payout is funded not purely out of the 
coupons, right? It's not purely funded out of, of income and uh, weak dividends. It is also uh, out of capital growth. So that's this combination. So it, you don't have to always like take higher risks in, in, in that sense. And the other part, which uh, perhaps this also shows you how Money Hour works with Fullerton, uh, we were already asking Fullerton about what has been happening in the rising interest rate markets actually to Asian bonds. Now, Asian credit is actually interesting because Asian credit, in terms of the credit spread, the extra yield that investors have to pay have actually come down, even as the underlying uh, sort of US dollar bond yields went up. Right? So, and then the overall yield is up, but actually I was quite happy because you launched launch the fund now, right? Actually, you go and buy, you actually get, get higher yield. So you, you, it, it's actually a not a, not a not a bad thing itself. And of course, in totality, you're, look, you're, not, you're not looking just at the pure bond strategy. Right? And in Money Hour in particular, we are quite uh, keen on... Uh, equities as the growth driver, really mainly as the growth driver. And, and so that's, that's where what Vincent described really comes uh, comes to be able to sustain that, that payout level of the fund, not excessively, uh, but not a very high volatility, but with this combination of both the natural yield as well as the, uh, uh, the capital appreciation potential of the fund. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I understand that we overran slightly, so we'd like to take our last question. So our last question um, from Hartini is, I like the components of this fund, but how is it different from Asian equities? As I know that you are using global equities instead. Uh, and then he mentioned that he has the heritage fund. Yeah. Um, so maybe again, let, let, me, let me try try to answer that. Um, <laughs> Asia assets, whether you talk about Asia equity, Asia credit, or Asian currency, they have a very unique uh, uh, property that's different from global markets in that in a period of stress all three of them will fall together meaning uh, in the Asian crisis that we've gone through in the GFC in the uh, tech bubble and uh, very recently I suppose uh, in COVID-19 you've seen what happened the US dollar strengthened Asian currency weakened uh, Asian credit uh, fell because bond spread widened as well as Asian equity market has uh, fallen as well. It's very unusual, but this is a very common phenomenon for emerging markets. Why is that? Because emerging markets as a group <clears throat> is not a mature financial market. It is the market that depends on investors' confidence. So when you have a period of uh, uncertainty, instability, investors, global investors, pull money out. When they pull money out of Asia, <clears throat> the currency will fall, the credit market will fall, meaning bond yields go up, and also the equity market will also fall. So this is the weakness of a pure Asia-centric portfolio, and I'm very glad <clears throat> that in this construction uh, that we put together in this portfolio with uh, Money Hour, we have the global component. Because the global component means that uh, if another Asia-centric situation unfolds, uh, there's one part that's diversifying and hopefully doing well when the rest of Asia is not doing well. Uh, the recent weakness in the Asian market uh, is really driven by the strength of the US dollar. Uh, why is that? Because there are many factors, COVID-19 uh, being under control, the fiscal stimulus, all this uh, give confidence that US economy is doing much better. When you look at the size of fiscal stimulus, you really get a shock because the US government is putting as much as 35% of GDP into the system in the form of government spending. That really guaranteed that the recession is over. So when investors became aware that they are too pessimistic, they just bought up the US uh, market much more than the Asian markets. We hope that Asia economy would uh, also follow the, the, the rest of the world, recover, have COVID-19 under control, then all the four components would do well. Uh, if not, uh, as we know in, in the financial markets, there will always be up and down. By spreading out in four components, hopefully we have some cancelling effect and the journey will be smoother. Lah. Yes, well said, well said. Yeah, right now we have come to the end of our webinar. Uh, thank you 
Chris, thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Chinting, for taking the time to share and to speak to all of us. I'd like to invite everyone to leave us a feedback to help us improve the webinar. If you like the webinar, do let us know our uh, areas of improvement or any actually any topics that you'd like us to cover. Yeah, just let us know in the link over here. Oh, sorry, I'll remove the comment. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thanks to Vincent and Chris, to Sherry and our colleagues. But most of all, thank you to all the almost 200 of you who, who were born with us and stayed with us for, for, for two plus hours. So thank you again very much. Uh, do go on our website to look up not just one income, but also for planning in general and uh, retirement planning. And I hope that, you, you know, we'll all find uh, that that motivation and, and also that comfort, you know, in, in how we can holistically address our retirement income needs and passive income needs. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye, everyone. Thank you.